Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, when we were in Los Angeles recently, we talked with Lola Smallwood Cuevas about the Black Workers Center and its work. And we visit with domestic workers who marched to Washington to meet with the Pope. All that and a few words from me on the surprisingly low-cost emergency that can throw almost half of all Americans into a financial crisis. It's all coming up. Welcome to our program. Where is the juice in the U.S. labor movement? To answer that question, a lot of people look to Los Angeles, where the AFL-CIO held its last national convention in 2013. But L.A. is also the wage theft capital of the United States, where low-wage workers are robbed of some $26 million a week. In light of all that, how can workers build power? Lola Smallwood Cuevas directs the Los Angeles Black Workers Center, the first in California focused on solving the black job crisis. She's been empowering African-American workers and transforming the industries they work in for years now. To that job, she brought not just experience as an organizer, but also as a journalist. She worked as a Daily Beat reporter for the Chicago Tribune, the Long Beach Press-Telegram, and the Oakland Tribune before coming to her new job. Wow, well, thank you so much for having me here, Laura. It's wonderful to be with you. Why did we need a black workers center? We have unions, we have workers centers. What was the motivation and what were the challenges you were founded to address? So the motivation for the Worker Center really grew out of a program we have at the UCLA Labor Center called the African American Union Leadership School. It, it's one of five leadership schools. There's a leadership school focused on immigrant workers and Spanish language. There's a, a school to, uh, focused on the LGBTQ community. And the idea is how do you bring trade unionists together to learn together, to understand the economy together, to think about the um, their leadership and change in the economy, not just as union members, but also as community members, and sort of looking at the historic struggles of our community through the lens of work um, and opportunity. And so it was in that program that we did several research projects, including a focus groups talking to black workers about what was happening um, in their lives um, and sort of recognizing that though at the time the California economy had had an enormous expansion, um, but that black workers were in a dire situation. Mm -hmm. We were already, as the California economy was booming in the early 90s um, uh, into uh, the early 2000s, our communities were in some of the highest levels of unemployment and underemployment on record. And so it was in that moment that we realized we needed to do further study um, and a power analysis showed that in our communities, we have a lot of organizations who are fighting um, the conditions and trying to serve our way out of um, unemployment, trying to serve our way out of homelessness, trying mm -hmm. to serve our way out of mass incarceration. But how do we get at the systemic issues? And the systemic at the root of it is this economy. And well, so we decided to create the Black Worker Center as a space for black workers to develop bottom-up strategies. So talk about wage theft. I mean, uh, that's part of your agenda, looking up, to get what people are owed from the people who have it. How do you even define it? I mean, So wage theft is, is basically when a worker works and employer refuses to pay yeah. the worker, basically mm -hmm. essentially stealing their wages. It's, it's the crime of the century. It's a crime that um, has gone unaddressed in Los Angeles um, for, for many years, um, making Los Angeles the wage capital of the nation. Um, and it was one of the reasons why the Black Worker Center felt really um, adamant that we needed to be at the mm -hmm. table because when workers are not able to collect their wages after giving all that they have and contributing to the economy. It hurts not just the worker and their family, but it hurts our community as well. And so we joined the coalition fighting for the minimum wage, obviously, to mm -hmm. be raised. But more importantly, it doesn't matter if you raise the rate, wage if workers are not able right. to collect um, their, their wages. And so our effort was to say that the city of Los Angeles must not only pass the wage, but at, be provide robust and vigilant um, enforcement. enforcement. 
Um, and so we fought for the creation of a labor standards and enforcement division within the city, um, which was recently um, adopted along with the, the raising of the wage mm -hmm. um, in Los Angeles. Um, and we are looking at where are the industries where wage theft is prevalent, how do we outreach to workers, educate workers, how do we make sure this um, division is funded and well resourced mm -hmm. so that workers actually get the support that they need. Um, and for a black worker center, it was really um, important to bring other issues to the yeah. table too, which is looking at a wage theft that is more collective. Um, for us, um, getting in our community discrimination workplace exclusion um, prevents many in our community from getting access to wages. So how do we also look at not just the exploitation that's happening mm -hmm. in our labor market, but the exclusion that's behind that exploitation? And one of the um, uh, issues that the Black Worker Center is moving now, our focus is pushing forward an amendment that would empower the local agency to enforce um, provisions of civil rights mm to ensure that workers are protected and they're not just protected from wage theft in the traditional technical sense, but also protected from exclusion, which prevents many workers in our communities from getting access because to jobs. Because you've pioneered, it seems to me, a lot of policy work around what could make a difference. And, and I'd love you to talk a little bit more about that. It's not just pre bringing people to account when they're failing to do something that they've committed to do, but to putting policies in place that would actually change this picture more structurally. Talk about your, your Metro Labor Project. Mm -hmm. More generally, what does policy look like that is disadvantaged worker black worker friendly, mm -hmm. what do you want? What we want is on the ground enforcement. There are so many policies that deal with equal employment, that deal with anti-discrimination, but when you drive through Los Angeles and you look at construction sites, for example, it's as if those laws don't exist. Yeah. So what our community wants to see is robust enforcement that's on the ground. We need monitoring, um, and that was one of the provisions that we felt was so critical to our work to ensure that opportunities to build rails, to build hospitals, uh, to improve schools. And particularly if you're talking about public money, when you're talking yes. about public infrastructure projects, why is it so difficult to get the enforcement? All those public of officials are on the record supporting the policy. Well, I think that on the record for supporting the policy um, and, and and actually moving the policy forward. Uh -huh. So certainly we all wanna see a diverse workforce, but that doesn't happen until you actually have the policy and the enforcement implementation for that to happen. And so with the Metro PLA, it was about ensuring that the policy had language that ensured these were good jobs, mm -hmm. because in the past, you know, Local, even local statewide construction firms couldn't get access to these jobs. Mm -hmm. Folks could come in from other parts of the country and do this work and the money, our tax dollars walk right out of our communities. We wanted to make sure that there was also um, language in there for targeted hiring mm -hmm. so that we looked at particular zip codes where unemployment and underemployment were most acute, was most severe. And we really looked at building a workforce and pulling workers, 40% mm -hmm. of the workers for these projects um, at the Metro Rail Line pulling them um, from those communities onto the project. Because people talk about it, well, it's just the economy or it's just the way things are. You're saying there are levers in the hands of public power that can be used to make a difference on the ground, like the Absolutely. There's leverage. There's leverage of disadvantaged worker criteria, saying that workers who are formerly incarcerated, where workers who are emancipated from foster care, that they have an opportunity. So there are tools, and then there's also the next step, mm -hmm. which is how do we actually make sure that these provisions, disadvantaged workers, targeted hiring, um, how do we make sure they're actually realized? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that our members really pushed for was um, an implementation agreement that would allow workers to be at the oversight table mm -hmm. with the agency, working with the unions, um, working with the contractor, and reviewing and pouring over the data to see, well, what is the percentage of workers that are from our community and what is the complexion mm -hmm. of that workforce? Does it reflect our communities? Does it reflect the communities that are funding? Um, we've also instituted a community monitoring program that works with Metro mm -hmm. and we share reports from the community where we're looking at 
the workforce. What, where, how many African American workers are on the project, but also what kind of work are they doing? And we use that also as a vehicle for talking with the contractors and with Metro to ensure that the numbers um, are what we want to see. So it's kind see. of like an environmental impact statement, like what would be the inclusion impact of your policy and is it actually being implemented and enforced? That's right. Is, are any politicians talking about this? We had Larry Henley from the transit workers on the show the other day and he was talking quite warmly about Bernie Sanders, less warmly about Hillary Clinton. Is, are these issues of how do we change what's going wrong for workers at the bottom of the at the bottom of our pay scales. Is anyone talking at the national level about these sorts of policies, adopting what you're, what you're modeling? I think it's our responsibility to impact the discourse and to make sure that we're putting families first. We think at, we're at a state in our communities where we can no longer just let things move the right. way they do without us intervening. And so for the conversation for 2016 about where we want to see um, the presidential uh, priority set, we know that the issue of work, the issues of inclusion and diversity and equity is critical to the life of our um, yeah. families. And so it can't be simply um, waiting for um, candidates to talk about this issue. How do we actually help to move mm move that discourse forward. So our members participated, for example, in, in a press conference that was held, a community and labor press conference, when the Republican debate was in town, just talking about the effects of some of the policies um, that have moved forward, that have created such hardships in our communities, the, the lack of good manufacturing jobs, um, the deregulation, um, the deunionization, uh, all of the things that have created impact, not just for families now, but for our community, yeah. a compounded crisis that we've been experiencing for, for generations. Yeah, there's a real human cost, and it may be affecting humans that aren't you right now, but it'll mm -hmm. be coming your way next. Finally, I guess two things. You mentioned the fight for 15 and the focus on the, on the minimum wage. And as you've been talking, I've been thinking, that's been an effective strategy. It's been great language. Um, we've seen raises in the minimum wage. But there's no discussion of race in the framing of that. Is that a problem? Would you like to see that changed? Because most of those minimum wage workers we're talking about are workers of color, mm -hmm. a lot of them African-Americans. Well, I think the proof is in what we see. When you look at the marches, when you look at the demonstration, when you hear the conversation, it's black workers, it's Latino workers, it's young workers leading the fight. And I think we have, as a movement, to prioritize those voices. And part of our mission is to say that leadership is important in all communities. And how do we ensure that black workers, black worker organizing is at the center of our strategies mm -hmm. for systemic change in the economy, um, be it a labor table, be it a, a community um, organizing table, is to say that black workers have to be at that table yeah. and have to be instrumental in leading it and that we have to prioritize the building of the next and new wave of labor movement that includes more of the workers who are impacted by the conditions. Is that your message to the, the, to the traditional labor movement um, coming from the Workers' Center? What they can learn from you? Well, I think that we are seeing in LA, it's one of those places where it's, it's, it's a message that's been heard and it's a coalition that has been growing and building. Um, you know, coming from Los Angeles where we had a labor movement that, you know, 10, 15 years ago decided that there needed to be a coalitional approach in order to have Los Angeles be a place where workers could live and have a have an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that meant reaching south of the 10 freeway to South LA civil rights groups and organizations like Scope and Agenda. Um, it meant reaching east to you know immigrant rights organizations and building coalitions. And I think we're in the next phase of the maturing of that. And that's with the creation of the Black Worker Center and the, the uplift of black worker voices in this recent um, Fight for the 15, Raise the Wage movement. And so I see great opportunity for a different kind of labor movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Black Worker Center, we're organizing unemployed workers. These aren't union workers. Right. These are unemployed workers or underemployed workers who don't have a union and aren't part of a union organizing campaign. So I think we're already starting to erase those barriers mm -hmm. of what is a worker and what is a worker movement. Um, and increasingly, when you look around the table at worker centers, there's the Black Worker Center, there's the Filipino Worker Center, there's there's Chirla, which represents a lot of immigrant groups, there's Kiwa, um, the Korean Immigrant Workers Alliance. So 
we know that this is the face of Los Angeles. It's the growing face of America, and it's what's going to be um, the value added and what how we're going to change conditions for black workers, for all workers. Um, and um, we're honored to be a part of that movement. Um, but at the same time, we need to make space for that. We have to be intentional about it. We have to look at the complexity of how this economy is impacting workers. Black workers' issues is access. Mm -hmm. It's the historic exclusion, the historic um, denial theft. of work. It's the ultimate form of wage theft that our communities have experienced, you know, since emancipation. And so that needs to be recognized that on top of that, we have a broken economy, yeah. an economy that doesn't value work, that doesn't give workers protection, that refuses to acknowledge that workers should have right and say over what happens to them most of the hours of their lives while they're in their workplace. Not just on top of that, but related to that. That's right. There's a relationship. That's right. Our economy creates, developed this way because of the way it developed. <laughs> Out of unwaged slave, exploitive, brutal, um, inhumane experience. So that's what American work has grown. It's grown out of the black experience. And when you look at what's happening to black community and black work, you can't say, oh, it's their fault. Right. It's black workers. We have to know that it came out of, a, of the whole birth of what this economy is. And so we have to assault, contest, arrest, resist, all of the conditions that create the black jobs crisis because it is the American economy, economic condition. And that's the work that we're doing. And, and I feel that we are creating new alliances that say that that is not okay, right. that is wrong, and that injustice to black community and black workers is an injustice to all. I haven't asked you about the relationship between your work and Black Lives Matter. Let's mm. just end with that. It's implicit, mm. but it's explicit. You're involved with both. How do you see the connections? The connections are the inhumanity that allows our children to be killed in parks, that allows our kids to be killed on their block. That dehumanization is a result of compounded poverty. It's, comp it, it's, a, it's an example of the stripping of every ounce of opportunity and resource in our community. And we need to address and stop the bleeding. We need to put to stop the hemorrhaging and the loss of life. But what is causing that? We also have to connect the dots. And we've been involved in going to Ferguson. We're looking at creating a black worker center in Ferguson and joining another four new worker centers that are coming online across the country. Because we know the links between this police and state yeah. violence and the economic violence that's killing our families, tearing the social fabrics of our communities every day. So for us, Black Lives Matter is Black Work Matters and they're linked. Um, and we see this movement um, evolving in LA and we see it across the country to begin to connect the dots on what's causing this violence and this ongoing pain in our communities. There's a conference, a National Black Workers Centers conference happening this fall. It might be happening while people are watching this show. What should they know about it? Um, it is the second national convening of the Black Worker Center Network, and we will have over 100 participants this year. So we're growing, almost doubling our participation. Um, we are celebrating three worker centers, the Los Angeles Black Worker Center, which is the first center um, to open. And now we have the Bay Area Worker Center online. We have the Chicago Worker Center for Racial Justice. There are four other planning centers, Boston, um, St. Louis, Baltimore, D.C. that are coming online. We're very excited about that. And really, it's about how do we make a difference in the lives mm. of workers? How do we create new voice and power and activism? Because whether you're coming from prison or whether you're, you're skilled and trained, we face the same terrible economy that we have to fight through. Um, we can have all the reentry programs we want, but all workers are going to have to fight for a better opportunity in this country. Um, and so we are um, excited about the convening, about the conversation of Black Freedom Dreams, about what the work looks on the ground, what information we can share to advance the work, but more importantly, how do we create real space for our communities to turn trauma into change? Well, we're excited about it too, and we want to stay in touch with you. Lola, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you so much, Laura. You can find out more about the Los Angeles Black Workers Center and all the work that Lola Smallwood Cuevas is involved in at our website. Thanks for watching.
This past September, 100 women marched 100 miles to bring a message to the Pope. Filmmaker Bonnie Cassim was with them and brought us this report. Around the corner. What I'm going to take with me from this journey is the strength and the courage of all the women who I've walked alongside this past week, and I'm going to take it with me for the rest of my life. Yo creo que todas tenemos un motivo distinto, pero llegamos al mismo fin, que somos personas guerreras, somos personas que valemos y necesitamos dignidad y que nuestras voces sean escuchadas para todas las personas y le llegue a cada corazón. I learned this week there's a huge difference between solidarity and collective heart and collective voice and I'm leaving with the latter and this was the most important week of my life to learn that. Traemos nuestra voz para el Papa para que escuche este mensaje y nos ayude para esos 12 y más millones de indocumentados. It was really powerful to see so many domestic workers be present and show that they're like out of the shadows and show that we are a force together. Uh, para mí esta caminata fue histórica eh, porque yo soy católica y mi fe es muy grande y se me permitió estar aquí. El 11 de cada mes me comprometo también a caminar aunque sea una milla o todas las millas que pueda por los 11 millones de inmigrantes y en 11 meses. On the 11 of every month we're going to be walking and praying for those 11 million of immigrants that need our prayers and our sacrifices with love. Many thanks to Bonnie Kassam for that report on the National Domestic Workers Alliance March for Justice. Black workers' centers have been meeting nationally to deepen their ties and strengthen their political power. In a sane world, their agenda would be our national agenda, namely to build assets and access to resources for the least wealthy Americans. After all, how strong do we want 21st century America to be? By 2040, we'll be a majority-minority nation, so-called, meaning the majority of us will be living firmly on the wrong side of the racial wealth gap, less wealthy, less secure, and more isolated. What difference does wealth make? Well, the Federal Reserve gets at that question when, in their annual survey of consumer finances, they ask people how they would handle a $400 emergency. Last year, fully 47% of respondents said they wouldn't be able to cover it or only by selling something or borrowing money from somebody else. That's wealth. The little extra beyond your income, what's coming in and going out, that helps you cover a crisis, let alone invest in the future. Almost half of all Americans, the Fed found, don't have it add race to the picture, and it's even more disturbing. The Fed reports that the racial wealth gaps barely budged over the last 25 years, except to get bigger after the Great Recession. Between 2007 and 2013, net worth for white families rose from roughly five to roughly seven times that of black families. In absolute terms, that means net wealth stands at 134,000 for white families and just 11,000 for black. While incomes were only between one and two times greater for whites than for blacks, assets, all that wealth, was roughly five times as great for those with bachelor's degrees. And the inequality doesn't stop there. The Fed also asked about inheritances, that lump sum that can help families accrue wealth. 23% of white families compared to just 11% of black have ever received an inheritance. Only 6% of blacks expect ever to inherit wealth, as opposed to 19% of whites. The numbers for Hispanics are even lower. It's a lot of numbers, I know, but suffice to say, today the top 10% of white families hold 90% of the nation's total wealth, while black families hold a mere 2.7%. What the black workers' centers in Los Angeles and Baltimore and Chicago are doing, namely doubling down on securing wages, expanding, expanding access to contracts and capital, and exploring creative ways to build assets for the black working class, with or without, but especially with a non-white future looming, that's actually what we should be doing 
as a nation. Listen up. And find all my interviews and reports at the lfshow.org. Check out our new website. And don't forget, you can also get this program as an audio podcast. What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe, and thanks. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, what does it mean to put yourself on the line for your beliefs? Actress Kathleen Chalfont, who's known for her brave performances and her principled political stances. Art is not an amenity for the privileged. It is the deepest expression of the human soul. And we look at Stanley Cohen, a lawyer who's gone to jail. And there are some of us who challenge the system every way, every day. This week on the show, Ai Jen Pu, director of the Domestic Workers Alliance. How is it that after 75 years of exclusion, in 2015, when we need to be strengthening and growing this workforce, we're still fighting for these basic protections? Then a short film, No Sanctuary, looks at how the U.S. treats immigrant families by locking them up. These are prison companies, and their model and their experience is running prisons. 